Hello and welcome back to Revelation Reimagined, where we get to delve into the prophetic book of Revelation. What does it say about the end times? What does it say about the end of the world? What is it all about? We want to know how this book speaks to our lives. And in this online exploration of the book, as we discuss together, I'm joined by the panel from the far end. We have Michael Mahanu. Then further along, we have Peter Hughes, Roman Halupka, and my name's Darren Croft. We are four Seventh-day Adventist pastors who love to study and discuss the book of Revelation. In our previous session, we were in the chapter, Revelation chapter 12. It unmasked the, the origins of Satan, his method of lies and deception, his, his approach to counterfeit things which we'll see come through in today's session, and how he was such a contrast to the goodness of Jesus, the fairness and the willingness of God, and the fact that Jesus was willing to come and die in order to defeat the devil. So now we dig into a, a chapter that is full of beasts and the number 666. We see a beast that arises out of the sea, and the beast out of the earth. And the thing I'd say at this point is if you haven't read Revelation 13 until now, maybe just pause your watching, go away and have a read of Revelation 13, and then hit play again as we discuss this chapter. So, gentlemen, Revelation 13 starts, well, we see a dragon. Michael, tell me about why this chapter starts with a dragon. Yeah, so <clears throat> we, we have noticed uh, uh, in chapter 12 uh, the actions of the dragon, um, Satan, um, and definitely now he's very active. Uh, and right from the beginning we are told, um, I know that some translation uh, translations can be different, but my translation here it says the dragon stood on the shore of the sea. Um, and then we have the two beasts that uh, are, are coming up. Um, so definitely the dragon is continuing its actions. And we'll see actually that there is a counterfeit. And we know that this is the system that the dragon works on. That is counterfeiting God's work. Okay, Roman. Yeah, I, I would like to put our attention to the fact that maybe not everyone is aware of the fact that John writing the book, he didn't divide it into chapters. Mm. So as he started what we already studied and discussed in the 12th chapter, so of course he continues, he continues. We still have the scene, the dragon who is attacking the church mm. or the remnants of the church. We still have the scene that, that, that the dragon is present in this battle, what we used to call the great controversy between Satan and, uh, and Christ. But at the same time, you know, I would like to say, because uh, thank you, Michael, that you have mentioned that, that there are different translations. Mm. Uh, well, I'm Polish originally and you know in my translation the first verse uh, of chapter 13 in English Bible is the last verse of chapter 12 and and you know and it's not usually in all translations that I know and there are many of them in Poland in Polish language well uh, I should probably say that the over 40 translations into Polish language we have now and none of them is saying using the words Satan standing there uh, most of them they are saying then I stood mm -hmm. so what suggests John but it's not so important in this way because we still are aware of the fact of the presence of the dragon in this unusual fight all the time mm. so whether it's I, I guess what we're seeing here is <laughs> there there is something going on absolutely that's leading on from chapter 12 and we're not going to get our pants snagged on whether this should be at the end of chapter 12 or the beginning yeah. of chapter 13, because as, as Michael's pointed out, when this was written, there were no chapters yeah. and verses. No verses. Yeah. 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 Um, so let's just talk about the counterfeit for a moment, because we, we have this picture where, um, yeah, the, the devil who is the father of lies, um, yeah, what, what's, 
what's you know you talked about you used the word counterfeit mm. what do you mean by that just to tease that out a little bit more yeah when we look at chapter 13 we discovered that uh, the dragon the, the beast of the sea and the beast of the land they have characteristics of the father the son and the holy spirit in the way they are described uh, so the way god works the plan of salvation to serve humanity from sin and, you know, to reconcile humanity with him is by involving the, the, the Godhead into uh, the plan of salvation. And on the other side, we see Satan counterfeiting us, uh, uh, that image, uh, this, this uh, uh, Godhead uh, in trying to destroy. So we see, uh, yeah, as we read chapter 13, that actually the, this, these connections maybe I would say literally connections or uh, where, where the description is very much of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Mm. Peter, did you want to add comment on this one? Um, just a little, if I may. Daniel, when he was given the original visions that, that, that laid out the time that is in Scripture, described four beasts that would be opposed to God's people. Yeah. And that, and when you get to chapter 13 of Revelation, we're talking in terms of beasts. The beast came up from a sea, there was a beast from the land, there was the dragon who was giving authority to the beasts. So it was all in the terms of beasts. So chapter 13, as Michael and Roman have accurately stated, is describing the counterfeit of God. Mm. And God wants you to understand that there is a counterfeit. It isn't, it isn't as people often imagine, it is a deceit that uh, trying to lead you into what is a counterfeit understanding. Mm. It's, it's interesting, I think, when we look at the, the context of the broader sweep of Revelation. So, so chapter 1 to 12, of course, you, you have the importance of Christ revealed but in chapter 13, it, it almost shifts focus, doesn't it, where it introduces the false trinity. Um, Can I take you back just one chapter? Yeah, yeah. Chapter 1 was a description in Revelation of Christ. It revealed the I am mm -hmm. and Christ. Chapter 12 is actually revealing the counterfeit, revealing the dragon. Yeah. And he's, he's mm -hmm. described as a fiery red dragon with seven heads and ten horns. So chapter 12 identifies Satan. Yes. And then into chapter 13, we are having revealed the other aspects of the counterfeit. Yeah. So 12 identifies Satan. 13 identifies those powers, those forces that will counterfeit or are a counterfeit with him. So I wonder whether chapter 12... You know, I think we used the word hinge. We talked about yes. chapter 12 being a bit of a hinge in the book. Yes. And, you know, I think in chapter 12 you do see that introduction of the devil, yes. but you also see the, the contrast to Jesus in yes. that. Now, yes. chapter 13, there, there's, it doesn't go completely dark. There's still glimmers of, of yes. light there. Yes. But it, it 12, shifts to more darkness, doesn't it? Yes, 12 introduces Christ reacting to what Satan is going to counterfeit. Yeah, yeah. He, he's, it, it introduces the war, doesn't it, between Christ oh. and Satan. Yeah. And that, so, so Christ is in chapter 12 as well, but it is the main point of chapter 12 seems to be the introduction of the counterfeit of Satan and the dragons. Yes. And what they're going to do. Yeah. That's the beginning of that. So, so let's just, just for a moment, you know, <coughs> what's going on inside, um, inside this desire to set up a counterfeit? Why is that so, um, why does it matter? Why set up a counterfeit God? Mm. Satan has the intent to take our worship. He's seeking people to worship him as God. Yet Satan isn't God. <clears throat> Satan was a created being. So he's trying to usurp people's worship and 
adoration and claim he's wanting to claim God's worship. And if you allow him to claim your worship, he's succeeded in deceiving you, hasn't he? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Michael? Uh, the word Satan actually means the deceiver. And when we look um, right from the beginning in the Garden of Eden, Genesis chapter 3, he deceived, he acted de- deceitfully, uh, deceiving Eve and then what happened. And from there, he was, he's always distorting the truth, acting in a deceitful way. And we see in chapter 13, actually, that's how he works. Mm-hmm. So, so here we've got Satan, two beasts. Later on, it's, there's another terminology introduced that you've got Satan, the beast, and the false prophet. Um, and so as we see them, it's this incredible contrast, light, dark, mm. good, evil. Um, I guess there's a reason why Star Wars and some of these things come up with their good versus evil plots. It's here in Revelation. Mm. Um, let's look at Revelation 13 itself um, as we get into the beast out of the sea. So the, the opening of it there, you know, I saw a beast coming out of the sea. He had ten horns, seven heads, ten crowns on his horns, and each had a blasphemous name. And then you see the beast resembles a leopard, but feet like a bear, mouth like a lion. The dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. And so it continues. Let's talk about the symbolism here for a few minutes and, and, you know, pick whatever symbol you, you want to pick up on here. But what does the symbolism of the beast out of the sea tell us and where does it come from? It says that it comes from from the sea. So it means mm-hmm. that it comes because the sea always, according to 17th chapter of Revelation, uh, points that's a symbol of the multitudes of people, crowds of people. So it means that it must come from the from the area where a lot of people live. So it arises out yeah, of nations. That's, that's, yeah. that's, that's the first thing, what is very important. Uh, and then, well, we have the beasts with characteristics that absolutely fit and, and so close to, to, to the dragon because that's, that's everything what, what he does, mm. the beast will, will do. So it means that, that he's just behind. Well, the, so he's the power behind yeah, the throne. Yeah, we have to realize that uh, Satan is never coming. <laughs> Good morning, I'm the Satan. I'm going to tempt you. <laughs> That's you know he's using different ways that that you know it will sound so beautiful, so mm. nice, so wisely. Mm. Mm. That's the problem. Satan tends mm. to use, use other people. You don't see Satan directly attacking people. He uses Mm. earthly powers or earthly people to do his attack for him. Mm -hmm. And that, so uh, he he wants you to to, um, not consider him to be a threat, but to consider the, the forces around you a threat. He's trying to misdirect you. He, he in effect, when we when we look at the beast from the sea, in every respect it has the same characteristics as the dragon, with the exception of the colour. The dragon was fiery red, mm-hmm. whereas this beast from the sea is composed of the elements that Daniel prophesied mm-hmm. in his prophecies. It has the feet of a bear, the body of a leopard, the head of a lion, and then the dragon gave him his power. Mm. So he's, in every respect, he's, I could, I, I could call him the son of Satan. So, so there's a clear connection here with Daniel 7, isn't there? Yes. Mm. So, so, and this is, you know, it's not something we'll go back to Daniel 7 now, but it's worth going back and having a look at mm. because same animals, yes. same time frames pop up. Yes. Um, mm. And, and the saints, the saints are persecuted and they are conquered, mm. and that's the main idea that appears in chapter seven in Daniel. Yeah. So we can't escape actually the uh, noticing the resemblance between chapter seven in Daniel and Revelation thirteen, and that's where the conclusion, Revelation is the continuation 
of, of the book of Daniel and where we are given more information, expansion mm. of the prophecies in the book of Daniel. So, so both of them, both Daniel 7, Revelation 13, you've both got worship front yeah. and center, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. And the, the time frame as well here, we are given 42 months, where in the book of uh, Daniel, we have time, times, so and half a time, that is actually the same period of time. Yeah. So definitely there's an overlapping here of, of prophecy. And when we put... Uh, the, 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 when we have the understanding of, of the prophecies of uh, Daniel 7 and all the other prophecies, we, we understand the time span uh, in the book of Revelation as well. I'm surprised with one thing, you know, so much. How is it possible? We, we just made the list of many things. They are obviously bad, evil, and they shouldn't be followed. The whole world marveled and followed the beast. What is happening? Mm. So that's, we have to realize, you know, and I think that's, uh, that's a good time to mention it, that we can be so easily tempted and so easily cheated and will believe something that will follow. That's something dangerous. After those comments, I would say that oh, no one will follow it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But suddenly the whole world is following. But if you think about it, Roman, you look around the world today and how many people are willing to follow a person because they're powerful or famous or rich. Yeah. And this power combines all of those. Absolutely. Um, and maybe human nature now is not so much different to yeah. all along the way. And always those people pretend to be so good, so loving. Yeah. And that's the problem. Can I raise Daniel once more? In Daniel, there were two time periods that specifically Michael mentioned yep. and that the 1260 <coughs> months and uh, 1260 days, 60 days and time times and half a time and 42 months. Five times in Revelation between chapters 11 and 15 these time periods come up again. Mm. So in total there are seven warnings about this specific time frame. Yeah. And that, so it is something of significance mm. and you should take note of it, please. Yes. Well, and I think this is important because that gives us the understanding that it's the same prophecy, but from a different angle, from mm -hmm. a different perspective. So it, it's easier for us to connect all this information and say, oh, all right, so this is that period of time and this is the same period of time and the other one is the same period of time a different description a different approach i guess each one is telling us a little bit more yeah, isn't it correct um and i guess we you know we do that sometimes we will tell a story over and over and sometimes we'll add extra detail in and if you're listening you get a more rounded picture so in terms of just quickly this time frame that we're talking about here so we're talking about the period that we understand to be the Middle Ages or the Dark Ages, yeah. um, where you have a, a church state power that rules Europe, and that period really doesn't fully come to an end until 1798. Um, so we're talking from about 538 through to 1798, um, we'll come back and we'll fill in some of that detail in future sessions, but it's yeah. it's worth just mentioning that time frame so that people understand mm -hmm. yeah, what we're referring to here. In, in Bible, sometimes a year is designated as a day, or you can flip it, a Thanks, day Peter. means yes. a year. Yeah. And that, so if we're talking 1260 days, we're talking 1260 years. Yeah, yeah. All right, let's, let's just have a look here. So at the end of Revelation 13, at the, the, the beast out of the sea in verse 10, it has this, this final little piece at the end of it. It just says, this calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of God's people or on the part of the saints. And what we're seeing here is, hey, during this period of time, things are going to be pretty tough. So hang on, endure have patience and so this is where i want to invite you to have a look then at the language that's used surrounding the beast out of the sea because this really it, it helps it just leaps out at us as to the characteristics of this beast so in verse 2 
We see this beast has a blasphemous name on each head. What does blasphemous mean? All right. Let me throw it back to you, Peter. Tell me, what do you, what do you take it? <laughs> Christ was accused of being blasphemous when he claimed that he was from heaven, that he was the Messiah from heaven. Yeah. And people said, that's blasphemy. Blasphemy means you put yourself forward as God. Okay, so it's either claiming to be God or taking the place of God? Yes. Yeah. That's all the same. Yeah, it's it's blasphemy either way. Um, So this this beast claims to be God or claims to work on behalf of God wrongly, hence it's blasphemous. Verse 4, people worship the dragon and also the beast, that connection between the dragon and the beast. Mm -hmm. Um, Verse 5, it speaks blasphemies and slanders God. Mm -hmm. Verse (laughs) 6, you sense the recurring theme here? Yeah. Blasphemes God. Verse 7, It is given authority. Now, as it turns out, it's not legitimate authority, but authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. And then finally in verse 8, it says, all will worship the beast except who? Those who understand the truth. Yeah. Those who belong to the Lamb, that belong to Jesus, that know the truth. And that's why talking about this is, is so important. So whatever we do with the identification of this beast... It's clearly got a strong religious element to it. So let me throw the question out because we need to move on to the the beast out of the earth in a moment. How would you sum up the identity of this beast out of the sea? So personally, I would say, look, there has been many authorities um, um, over centuries on on this earth. All right, and every single like we, we look uh, in Egypt. All right, Egypt they worshipped different different creatures, different gods, and but the Bible doesn't say that Egypt was blasphemous. Yeah. So why this power is blasphemous? Why slanders God? Um, and not all the other pagan nations. That God doesn't, you know, mind of all the other, doesn't care that all the other. But this specifically, it has to be uh, a, a religious organization that takes God's name and then is misusing that name for personal uh, uh, usage, for personal advantage. So this is very, very dangerous. Mm. And this is why... We, we see here a Christian organization, uh, a Christian church that takes God's name uh, as using, using Jesus' name and the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, but misusing uh, these names for per- per- personal gain mm. uh, and distorting, distorting the truth. And this is, uh, this is where God says, no, you can't do that. Mm. You can't take my truth and use it for your own personal advantage. A religion that's about power and control is corrupt. Yeah. I noticed that, that, you know, it just came to my mind that, you know, the pharaohs in Egypt uh, also called themselves their gods. Mm. And in many kings, in many different countries, there was the cool. same. But there was a difference in this whole pantheon of gods they had. They were different gods, not characterized, not showing the characteristics of the real God that is in heaven. I think that the first time where we see something similar, it was Babylon. Mm-hmm. Where, where, you know, the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, for instance, he just considers himself that he's creating something. Who built such a fantastic city? Yeah. Who organized such a great empire? Who, who did it? Well, uh, I'm God. Mm. And but, that's, that's it's so important. Yeah. But, but Nebuchadnezzar <clears throat> never had been accused by God as, as uh, blaspheming him. Never. Right. He was treated like a human being full of pride, mm. and he, he received... You That's know, what I was going fact. to say. But yeah. It, yeah, it's interesting that here we are pointed out that this power does something that none of all the other powers have done. So it, it's leading us to, to the conclusion that it has to be a Christian where you, God is expecting a Christian church to 
live to the standards, all right? To live the faith, mm -hmm. to, to preach the gospel, and to bring, uh, bring people to, uh, to the truth. Where here, there is a church that is taking that truth, distorting it, and misleading people. Yeah, thanks. We, we, we're going to need to move on to the next portion of Revelation 13, and we're going to come to the beast out of the earth. This beast looks different. Let me just read the opening verses from verse 11. It says, Then I saw another beast coming out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb, but he spoke like a dragon. He exercised all the authority of the first beast on his behalf and made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed. And so it continues. It seems to me that there is something created in us, embedded in us in human, as human beings that we just need to worship someone or something. Mm. And this second beast, well, let, let's have a look at this second beast. This second beast is different to the first. Tell me what, what's going on with this second beast. Well, it's coming from the land. That's the first thing. Okay. So as we mentioned before, what means, you know, coming from the sea, because the sea, the much water always is connected with the crowds of people. So this time we have completely difference. Uh, that's that's you know we have the beast that's coming from the place is the land so it means there are not so many people there they may, maybe not know yeah. it anyway yes. that's that's the first thing what what is noticed but yeah. but the second very characteristic is that you know it's it supports everything what was what has the first beast done uh, and and you know it's it's similar exactly similar in everything mm -hmm. And, and it tries to rebuild, you know, the power of the first beast. Mm. Yeah. Well, what about the lamb, you know, this lamb-like thing that's going on here? What's... It has the appearance of being Christ-like, but it doesn't carry that appearance through because it speaks as a dragon. It's, it's repeating the deceptions of Satan, though it portrays itself as being Christian. So it's still, it, it's counterfeit on steroids, Yes, if I can put yes. it that way, Michael. And it's interesting that this beast is not blasphemous. It doesn't tell us. So, so it's more likely that this second beast is not a religious organization. Uh, it's probably a civil organization, so it's, it's, but it's, it's an organization that submits to, um, to the power of, of the first one. And in the same time, there is a chronology, chronology here, mm -hmm. because the bees don't come in the same time, one from the sea and one from the land and say hello, uh, but uh, they come one after another. So the first, the first uh, power that appeared here suffered uh, a wound uh, that was a deadly wound. So it was quite something very significantly happening there. Mm -hmm. Do you think it might have been considered killed? Death. Yeah, killed, yeah. killed and resurrected. It was done. So this is where we, we think is the false trinity because uh, Jesus was, was killed and he came back to life and we yeah. see this beast was being killed. And, and coming back to life. It's, it it's it comes back to life. Like yeah. it, 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 you, you can see that. So, um, yeah, the, the second beast comes to promote the first beast, like the Holy Spirit that came actually to uphold the ministry of Jesus. So that, that the, the, really there's happened. so much in that, that Trinity counterfeit thing because, you know, Jesus says, I and the Father are one. The beast out of the, the sea is very much, you know, Satan and the beast out of the sea are one. The, the beast out of the earth directs worship to the beast out of the sea. The Holy Spirit directs worship to Correct. Jesus. And so as the Holy Spirit reveals Jesus to us and Jesus reveals the Father, the same thing's happening in a twisted way with the, the counterfeit trinity. You're, we're talking very much about beasts in this section of what we're saying, aren't yeah. we? And if you understand that when you use the term beast, you're talking of a counterfeit, yeah. a counterfeit religious organisation. 
you're not talking, or, a, or an organisation like Michael hinted to previously, that it is maybe not a religious organisation, but wanting you to worship a religious organisation. So it's essentially the, the muscle to... Yeah. In, it's the enforcer. Well, if, if, it's, if, it isn't, if it isn't a religious organisation, then it means it's a civil organisation. And as a civil organisation, it has it must have authority to enforce. Mm. So it's a religious it's it's not a religious organization but a civil organization that is going to enforce religious principles. So what we see here is this even though it's a, a, a civil power if you like, it obviously has religious sympathies to direct worship to the beast that is the religious power. Yeah. Um, the, the other thing you see when you look at it is it obviously has considerable power because it has the ability to force people to do things and it also has the, the technology, the power, the influence to be able to say, you know, down a little further, um, he also forced everyone small and great, that's verse 16, rich and poor, free and slave to receive a mark on his right hand or on his forehead so that no one could buy or sell unless he had the mark, which implies to me that they've also got power over whether you can buy and sell. Yeah. That's yeah. not an idle threat. That's, that's something that's real. Mm -hmm. Much more we could say about this. You know, you see the deceptive fire coming down from heaven. It's, it's, you know, drawing us back to the days of Elijah. Um, can we talk about the mark of the beast? Can you talk about fire from heaven for a second? Oh, let's do that. Go on, Peter. Go on. In, in ancient times, people considered lightning fire from heaven. So it is going to be some forceful power that can cause a destruction when it hits the earth. And I, I often watch these planes in, when they're at war firing their rockets and you see a lot of symbolism is involved in this. And that's so don't be, don't get caught up in the symbolism. Be, be willing to understand that this is a symbol that is going to be fire from heaven. Yeah. Now, I guess if you go back to the, the books of Kings with the story of Elijah there, it was literal fire that came from heaven. Mm. And, um, you know, you can read that story there. In this case, you know, is it going to be literal? Is it symbolising something? And I guess I, I remind myself of Jesus' statement that, you know, when you see these things take place, you might believe, and that's what I understand to be the mm. purpose of prophecy. So we look mm. at it and we say, well, it could be. Let's keep our eyes open, but until it actually happens, we won't necessarily know for sure yes. exactly what it is. Mm. Mm. What do you think? I, I think you've answered it well. Uh, thank you, Peter. Mm. I'll go. Let's talk Mark of the Beast then. 666, you know, this is the one that people get excited about sometimes. What's going on with, with the mark of the beast? Is this a, a barcode, a tattoo on your forehead, a microchip being planted somewhere? So I, I remember I was young when um, I came across for the first time this one. I, I still remember that picture uh, that depicted a, a human hand with a barcode here. I said, wow, oh, is that true or not? And that was the time when the barcode on, on products were oh, look, I, I remember back when it was bank card with the B, with the, yeah. you know, the multiple. Oh, that was 666, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and then later, uh, there's this video that was circulating that um, there's a microchip that they will put it under your skin and, you know, and indeed it looks like in some countries they, they're they doing this or I don't know. So they put it under your skin and you can't take it out. If you try to take it out, it will break and it will kill you. So all these, you know, amazing stories. Um, yeah, so it, it looks like personally I see that they changed the story uh, to fit uh, the fears of people from from uh, 
age to age uh, after a certain number of years when when that is not an issue anymore because they notice the barcode actually is nothing but just a commercial thing to quickly go through the counter and pay for your... Uh, yeah, so we've gone from bank card to barcodes yeah, to yeah, microchips. Yeah, they're just changing to, changing yeah. all the time. So, so um, yeah, if I've been defeated once, I don't need to be defeated again and again and again and again. Let's just open our, our eyes and see actually what okay. it says here. So we, we're saying it's not that. <laughs> yeah, no, not definitely. That. Let's be clear, not barcodes or anything like that. So what is it? Well, first, if I may, uh, I always ask myself, how much does it apply to personal life of every one of us? Because that's, we have the tendency as people, as we have so many characteristics here, well, just look around and to point to, to something, to somebody, or, and that's, yeah. that's a tendency, always. Why God is giving so many characteristics? Why God is telling us so much, so many details about his powers? I think that the first reason is that every one of us will think, well, is it possible for me to have those characteristics? Mm. If I do it, so I can be the power of the beast, in a way, Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's something very important. And telling you the truth, <laughs> that's, that's my opinion, that God is not giving everything, you know, just to, to point the finger to one side and say, well, I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm not. Well, God is giving us just look at yourself, find mm -hmm. yourself, because thinking about salvation, that we can have a part in this, that I can do something to get the salvation, that I can, I can, I can work on this with my good deeds. Well, the saints, as we're called generally in Christianity, well, it puts me on this good side and the others can be, you know, I, I will never take mm -hmm. part in this. We have to be very careful. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's just generally not, not answering straight, uh, down to your question, but, but you know, I think so that, that it's more important. We have to personally think it's why it is telling me just to look around. Mm -hmm. If somebody, I can say he is the beast or, or this organization is the beast or, or this theory is the beast. No. Mm -hmm. So, what about me? So, so we can be beastly if we take on its characteristics. I, I believe so. I believe so. And the first, the most simple thing is, if you want to be saved by our own deeds, mm -hmm. and, and we just, well, Jesus will add something, and we worked, and that's what counts. All right, Peter, we, we, we haven't got the answer here yet. Can you give us the answer? <laughs> we, we'll, we'll try. <laughs> so he's going to avoid in the discussion <laughs> in the discussion that we've been having we've been going back and looking at things as they existed in times past yeah mention was made of babylon um mention has been made that of daniel and the images that daniel portrayed and he portrayed the anti-christian the anti uh believing system as being beasts and that, and that hasn't changed through scripture. And the same is with God. When God, if we were to go back in scripture, we could show, show you texts that say, I am the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I don't change. And that, so if he doesn't change, if God doesn't change, then the message doesn't change. So anything that changes that original message is the counterfeit. All right. I, I'm going to jump in here because I want to get to the answer. What is this mark of the beast that it's talking about? Can I try? Can I try? Michael. <laughs> in chapter 14, we have a new notion that is introduced, a new name that is Babylon. Yeah. All right, and and we we find many elements in the book of Revelation that actually are connected to to the hist historical events of the people of Israel yeah. and Babylon. What is Babylon? It comes from Babel, that was confusion. 
all right? And, and Babylon was uh, uh, an oppressor of, of God's people. Mm -hmm. uh, Babylon, they came three times and they destroyed, the last time they destroyed the temple and it, it was a disaster there. So, uh, so no wonder why the book of Revelation takes this um, in a spiritual sense, because we know Babylon is not there anymore. But in a spiritual sense, from a religious, spiritual point of view, we live in a Babylon where there is confusion. And 666, where does it come? Where well, the Babylonians were very good uh, mathematicians. So they came with um, 360 degrees of the circle, with uh, 60, mini 60 seconds, uh, a minute, 60 minutes, an hour. So they had this... Six, that was very important for them, mm -hmm. all right? And in the amulets, actually, there's this formula where you put all these uh, numbers and wherever you count, you you come to six, 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 and I don't Six think... rows horizontally, six rows vertically. So and then worn by the Babylonian you add priests. the numbers and you come to six, six, six. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's a very, very clever... Uh, you know, mathematical discovery, how, how they did there. So it's impossible not to make connection actually to that Babylon. So I, I would say... The Tower of Babel was where they introduced counterfeit gods yeah, into that was, the pagan system, wasn't it? Yeah, that was so, the start. So, so if I can... So we, we're talking about a warning against false worship, yeah? Yes. Yeah. And the other thing I want to add on that is, you know, it talks about the, um, the, the mark of the beast being forced on everyone or they could receive it willingly, either in the hand or the forehead. The hand, I'll just take it in the hand and, and roll with it. I might not agree with it, but I'll, mm. I'll take it anyway. The forehead, of course, this is the seat of our moral decision-making. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so... It's not so much, well, we've already said it's not a barcode or anything like that. It's just an indicator that here's where we make our decisions. So we can decide to follow Christ or we can decide not to or we can just go with yeah. the flow. So if, if, I, if I may, so 666, so it's not a, it's not a number. It's not something that it will be on, on the forehead or any other microchips or anything, or even the vaccination as lately some people have been, you know, proclaiming yeah. that the vaccination is the mark of the beast. And the, this is just uh, uh, disturbing and confusing people. 666 is a human-made doctrine, is the human-made gospel. Because when we read chapter 14, Clearly, it makes this contrast. Thank you. All yeah, right, the, yeah. the everlasting gospel that has never changed, uh, and with the, the false gospel that the Trinity, the false Trinity, is, is proclaiming. So this is the final, the final battle that is going to take place, and this is what the warning is all about. Are we going to follow the the, the human made, the man made doctrines? Uh, that is 666, is human, human, human. There's nothing that God has in it, or we are going to follow the pure, genuine gospel of Jesus Christ that has never changed. Yeah. So that's the, the, the real battle and the contrast between the two. I, I can see Raymond wants to get in on this All one. Right. Our, our, we're getting towards the end of our time, but you've given us a good sneak preview of, of where we go next time. Raymond? That's what I wanted to say. That Thank you, Michael, for saying it. So, mm. but, but, you know, you just proved what I said, mm. because uh, that's human-made gospel. Absolutely. That's something what I can do it in my in my life also. My concept of, of, of salvation, my concept of anything. And that's the problem because that's so easy after looking at those characteristics to point to something that is wrong. But that's why we're doing it. Just to accuse? No. Why just to show somebody? Well, let's show Jesus. Let's let's show uh, his way, and that's that's something what is so important. So so that's the reason I was just insisting on this tendency, rather personal applying this truth than than generally looking for this. But but you summarized it in a beautiful way. Thank you very much. It, it seems to me that as we've gone through this chapter, you could be tempted to think, you know, is is there any hope? 
Um, it looks pretty dark. It looks pretty gloomy for the people of God. And just quickly, as we, we look through three verses, you know, Revelation 13, 7 talks about this first power being given power to wage war against God's people, his holy people, and to conquer them. That doesn't sound good. Uh, verse 10, you know, this calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of God's people. And by verse 17, those same people, are, it's said, they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark. There is going to be, you know, tough times for the people of God. Now, Revelation tells us that, you know, in this time it calls for wisdom. And fortunately, in our next session, we do get to Revelation 14. And in Revelation 14, we go from the dark and the gloom here mm. to a magnificent message here where this, this beast out of the sea is given authority over every tribe, people, language and nation. In the next chapter, there is a message for every tribe, people, language and nation. And we'll get yeah. to that message next time. So, gentlemen, now we need to wrap up. We haven't covered all of it by any means, but if you were to sum up, you know, give us your, your key takeaway from what we've discussed today, what would it be? Michael, I'm going to start with you. I'm, I'm looking at the idea of, uh, of worship. Um, I think for me it's important, it's important whom do I worship to. And we live in a time when we think that worshipping ourselves, you know, my truth is not your truth. Your truth is not mine. I have my own truth. You know, we start to, to worship ourselves. So worship is very important. And worship is, is what defines, what separates God's people from, from the others. Thank you. So yeah. this, is, this is very important for me. Yeah, good. Peter? If you're a believer in a creator God, if you believe that... We didn't descend from apes, but we were made for a purpose, a specific purpose. Then, and we also put that together with the concept that God doesn't change. So that if you believe in a creator God, then you believe that what he created is his and it doesn't change. Don't follow false made. Mm perceptions, beliefs. Yeah. Go back to your Bible and base what you believe to be what you've learned from reading your Bible. Yeah, thanks Peter. Roman? Well, as we started our study of the book of Revelation, on the, in the first chapter we find out that this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And in 13th chapter, we can see, well, where, where is Jesus there? Well, I think that pointing to all those characteristics of the other power opposite to Jesus, we can see something precious and wonderful, what is with him. We can be on his side in this way. And that's what, for me, counts so much. Yeah. Well, thank you, gentlemen. I think this has been a really good chapter. And I think as we go into our next session, you're going to see an amazing invitation. And for me, I think the message is if we find ourselves in the wrong place, if we find ourselves <clears throat> as part of a power that's persecuting others, uh, a power that's about control and, and just power, um, time to, to move and go and be where God wants us to be. Let's just pray. Father, we thank you for the, the book you've given us. We thank you for the truth that it reveals, for the Jesus that, re that it reveals and the way that it also reveals the, the, the counterfeit that's out there. So just be with us as we close this session off. May you continue to bless and guide our reading of Scripture in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And next week, next time, whenever you watch next time, we will be into Revelation 14. Do read it before we get there, and you're going to discover three amazing messages that can change everyone's life. Thanks very much. Okay.